it's how can you cool it as, as inexpensively as possible? And you can address that by firstly doing what we call free cooling. Free mm. cooling is use the ambient air outside. If it's cool enough outside, just simply bring the air in. And, and, and it's amazing that hasn't been done to any great extent in data centers. The other thing is to look at the um, temperatures that you try and maintain the data center at. Yeah. They're keeping them too cold, typically. And all of the new electronics equipment is perfectly good at um, 30, 35 degrees. Now, it may be uncomfortable for technicians to go in there mm. to do their maintenance, but um, you know, you have to strike a balance. Good day, everybody. Welcome to IT Web TV. Uh, today we are broadcasting from the Data Centers Conference uh, in, in Sancing. And today we are joined by uh, Aubrey Nozum, who's the managing director of Irish firm, uh, tech firm rather, it's called Acrevis. Aubrey, welcome. Thank you very much, Samuel. Good. Uh, Aubrey, let's just uh, start the conversation by trying to understand why you're here. What are you doing here? <laughs> Well, we've created over the last 10 or 15 years a technology company, European based. Um, it, it, it's based uh, on a foundation of trying to find the, the most efficient ways to cool um, critical telecoms infrastructure. Started off with the telecom industry, so the companies that you would know here, the, the Cell C's and the MTNs and Vodacom. Um, cooling the small infrastructure around the, around the telephone networks. And that's a, a business that's evolved over the years. From our perspective, it's fallen off a bit now. A lot of that infrastructure is in place. The technology's moved on. The equipment is outside. So we've had to um, pivot the business over the years, and, and we're very much now focused on the same type of cooling, precision cooling, for edge data centers, fiber landing stations, and... Um, fiber repeater repeater stations and um, we're, we're here because it's very difficult to be a, a small player mm -hmm. in a global world uh, we, you know we encounter clients who um, operate on, on all the continents and therefore we have to we have to be prepared um, you know to either help clients who, whom we have from back in Europe mm -hmm. to um, realize their ambitions in Africa or of course if we can if we can find some new companies here as well there will be there will be a lot of this work will be done mm -hmm. on the continent it's big it's bulky type stuff you know it's not like a little box that will ship cheaply so um, uh, that will that will happen and we're here to try and engage with the companies that will build out that infrastructure mm. there's a lot of construction of data centers that's taking place across the continent and one of the key things coming out of this is uh, the issue of sustainability, you know, uh, sustainable data centers. And this is the space where you, you, are, you guys operate. How key is it for these new data centers to be sustainable, to be, try and be innovative, to try and meet their standards? Yes. Well, I, I think it's 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 going to be absolutely crucial to them. Like, I mean, not only, you know, in South Africa have you got limitations on power availability, which which we hear about all of the time, but like in Ireland, in, in the UK, around Europe, um, data centers, the, the, the requirement for data is putting significant pressure on the power generation network that we have. Mm -hmm. So all of the data centers um, through normal commercial um, pressures within their companies and also from a regulatory point of view are going to have to become far more sustainable up to now. They've just pumped electricity into them and, and nobody has, has really cared. So that's going to be changed. They're going to have to deal with all sorts of things that, you know, things that I'm not involved in, data centers, I think, are somebody told me last week, accounting for 10% of the production of cement globally. Mm. Cement is a wickedly um, harmful um, product so in, yeah. in terms of things. So but we're not involved in that area, but they're going to have to deal with everything. Our little niche is, is helping them you consume the least amount of energy 
to cool the infrastructure. And, and, and there's various technologies happening. You hear about liquid cooling will come in over the next few years. That will, will play a role. Um, but in, in the cooling side, it's how can you cool it as, as inexpensively as possible? And you can address that by firstly doing what we call free cooling. Free cooling is use the ambient air outside. If it's cool enough outside, just simply bring the air in. And, and, and it's amazing that hasn't been done to any great extent in data centers. The other thing is to look at the um, temperatures that you try and maintain the data center at. Yep. They're keeping them too cold, typically. And all of the new electronics equipment is perfectly good at um, 30, 35 degrees. Now, it may be uncomfortable for technicians to go in there mm. to do their maintenance, but, um, you know, you have to strike a balance. So we would be preaching, uh, we would be preaching, look at your internal temperatures. By raising your internal temperatures, you're increasing the opportunity all the time to bring in more free ambient air. And, and that is virtually free. You're just fan power is all that's required to bring it in. And from your engagements with the uh companies on the African continent and in South Africa. Do you think there is an appreciation of that these technologies are necessary for them when they are constructing their, their facilities? I think there is. I think there's a reasonable awareness. Um, it's 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 a bit it's a bit there's a toss up as of course it's been happening for forever yeah. between price, capital cost and operating cost, you know, capital cost. So somebody wants to build a data center um, and if the entity building it and designing it mm -hmm. doesn't have that vested interest in the ongoing costs, I mean, why will they care too much unless it's unless they're forced by regulations? They will try and deliver the project at a reasonable cost. So unless the end client who is going to be paying the electricity bill, yeah. or governments who step in and say, that's fine, we're, we're not allowing you set up wasteful infrastructure. Um, so if, if, that, if there's a disconnect between the developer and the operator, yeah. then you still leave yourself quite wide open to get the lowest cost capital solution, which may not be the lowest cost solution if you take the um, capital cost plus, say, the running cost over the first five or five or six years. Mm. So that's something which um, which will need to be watched. I, I'm, I've got to catch up myself on mm. on what the regulatory requirements are here. Certainly, I, I've sat in on several seminars within the European Union in the last while, and the the extent to which the European Union now is interesting itself in the minute detail detail of how data centers operate, the temperatures inside them, outside them, what they're doing with the waste heat, the EU is all over them and things will radically change. Okay. Thank you so much for your insight. As we conclude, what are some of the key opportunities that you are seeing for, for your, within the data centers in the sector? Well, for companies like yourself. Yeah. <laughs> you know, firstly, the, the, the growth is going to be massive, you know, uh, and there will be, there should be plenty of business for everybody that's in the sector over the next while. Um, for us, we've got to try and, and be, be niche. Of course, you have, for small companies, you have the challenges of the really big guys. The, 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 you know, for example, we have our friends Huawei are here, main sponsors at this event. And of course, you know, they can come in and provide an entire infrastructure and, and supply everything. So we really need to see the uh, African constructors and builders of equipment come to the fore and build their own infrastructure and maybe we can help them with some niche areas like the cooling and maybe if, if we can get the scale there you will, we've got to come here and make the product I mean there is a, a big requirement to do that but you need scale you need economies of scale to be able to do that certainly something we wouldn't rule out um, um, so we are looking to to understand um, how who is going to build out the 
infrastructure on the ground, mm -hmm. the fiber, who's going to roll it from the landing stations to the, to the major cities, to the major data centers, uh, who's going to interconnect those data centers because data has to be held in multiple locations for, for security reasons. So, yeah. you know, they're all going to need to be linked and um, we, we will be hoping to participate strongly in that sector if we can, you know, find the right partners, support them properly mm. and um, the future should be should be quite good. And in, if I'm a developer of a facility, I'm building my own facility, why should I engage activists over other, <laughs> other suppliers? What differentiates your, well, your technologies to the rest on the market? Yeah. Well, firstly, we're, 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 we're quite certain we're, we're doing more free cooling than anybody. Uh, the PUE levels we can hit are very, are very, very low. Um, and that's because our products were designed to do that in the first place. We have competitors. They will say they're doing the same thing, but they added it in afterwards, and therefore they're not doing it to the, to the optimum. We've invested in machine intelligence mm -hmm. to try and, and um, again, have our equipment be placed and to learn where it's been placed, to know what the heat load is. Again, big, a big issue is somebody designs a data center and they say they're going to have so much heat coming off it. But of course, you never fill them up the first day. So these could operate for two, three, four years at partial capacity. Mm -hmm. So why specify and why set up your cooling and everything to deal with the worst case? when the worst case typically is come up. So we're trying to build that intelligence into our machine so that they know where they are and they know how to operate at the, at the, at the optimum. And then we're, 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 a, we're, a, we're a modest size company, we're small, we're flexible. We can, we can really partner with people well, support them well. We're not, um, we're not um, trying to deal with, with too many other things in our, in our lives. This is our business. Mm -hmm. Any chances of having a physical presence um, on the continent for activists? Um, it's it's something which we have. We, we, we were making really good progress in the, on the medical products a number of years ago, and mm -hmm. there were there were discussions well underway to joint venture with a company here in in Johannesburg to to have a facility. Um, those those kind of discussions got got. Um, got put on the long finger, let's say, uh, but, you know, there's, we're starting to look at them again. Certainly, um, certainly, um, we hear that from our customers. Mm -hmm. That's what they would like. That's what they want. Um, but, you know, challenges to do that in scale. It's hard to set up a little factory. Um, so it is, you know, you need to, you need to have, have certainty around the business. And it's something you wouldn't do speculatively either. You really will have to get locked into the contracts and then, um, and then um, put, the loca put the location here. Transport and everything will help justify that. Aubrey, thank you so much for your time. And I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much.